Hi everyone, this is Barb. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, looks like a bunch of uh, people have joined. So we're just going to give the presenters a minute or two to get on the call. Um, it is best if everybody can go ahead and have the webinar up on their screen and then can dial in uh, for audio. It tends to give us a better audio quality. And what you can do is the three dots that are at the top of your screen, if you click on that, it will give you switch to telephone and it will give you the call-in numbers. But if you aren't able to find that, you can just go ahead and call in. The number is 213-416-1560. With the access code 637-261-940. And while people are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get. Yeti, who has made herself known as always. And if my presenters are on the line, if you'll press star six to unmute your phone, that would be super. Hey, Carrie, go ahead and try uh, star six again. Checking to see if my audio is working. 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 It is, but we've got some feedback from you, Andy. Are you on your phone or your computer or both? Can you hear me now? I can, Carrie. Welcome. Mm -hmm. oh, technology. <laughs> yeah, sorry, everyone. I apologize for the technology challenges. Any meeting has changed their platforms and Rather than using a brand new platform, we decided to try and make the old one work. So we will keep trying to deglitchify, and we will be ready to start in just a couple of minutes, hopefully. So thank you for being patient. We will get this going as soon as possible. If okay. you are, is that better? Yep. Go ahead and say yes. Much. Okay. Hello. Robert. Hi, is that Robert? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Finally. All right, yes. Yeah, so we practiced last night, but of course that doesn't mean that you're not going to end up having uh, 
some new challenges, but this is Barb, and I just want to do a mouse tear roll call. Andy, are you there? If you're talking, Andy, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we had a bit of reverb that time. I think I fixed it. There you go. Okay, great. And Carrie, are you here? I'm here. All right, wonderful. And Robert, you here? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So what we're going to do is I can mute people if we start getting a bit of reverb. I'm going to ask everybody to mute your phones, including the presenters. Um, we will go ahead and do a polite handoff, so I will make sure we can hear everybody before we transition from presenter to presenter. But um, reverberation tends to be a real problem with this new platform, unfortunately. Um, so, welcome everybody. This is Barb and Robert Strum. You said that there was some reverberation. Can you let me know if this sounds okay? And you can go ahead and type answers in the chat box. Better, but still really fuzzy. All right. Um, is it fuzzy when you hear me, or is it fuzzy for everybody? Okay, it's the worst when I talk. Is that better? All right, so we'll just go ahead and do that. Um, and again, I apologize for the technology challenges. This is what happens when you are a you know, small nonprofit group. Um, we're trying to do our best with a free platform, and unfortunately, it does have some challenges and some, some tweaks. So welcome to the final MEPA Technical Assistance Webinar for the Positive Organizing Project Year 3. This is going to be about measuring MEPA. We've talked about meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS throughout the entire year that we have been partnering with the organizations and the grantees. And uh, what has been the most reoccurring question has been how do we measure MEPA? So we've got Barb Cardell, Andy Spieldener, Andrew Spieldener, Robert vasquez Pacher, and Carrie Hartel on the phone who will be helping me co-present this webinar. And um, hopefully by the time we're done, we will have an opportunity to workshop with you, our positive organizing partners, as we are going to try and create a way to measure MEPA, to actually look at organizational involvement and to see if it makes uh, sense. There is a chat box that we will keep up, and if people want to go ahead and uh, ask questions as we go along in the chat box, we will have a question and answer period at the end. Um, but we can address questions as we're going along if there is anything that needs further clarification. So thank you all for joining us. So here are the uh, yes indeed, your technical providers for today. We've got Carrie, we've got Andy, we've got Barb, and we've got Robert, and we will all take a part uh, in this presentation today. I am going to go ahead and kick it off. Um, I was doing some research for this webinar and uh, was really trying to find a good definition of what is meaningful involvement and was very interested in that I found a fairly classic definition in the U.S. Army glossary of key environmental terms for the Environmental Protection Agency and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so it doesn't actually involve people living with HIV, but I thought it was actually quite powerful. It talks about potentially affected communities having uh, opportunity to participate, uh, to have influence, that the concerns of participants involved in the decision-making process, and the decision-makers will seek out and facilitate the involvement of those potentially affected. I thought it was um, 
really very interesting to see that meaningful involvement has impact as well in uh, other communities and that in many ways when we feel like we are advocating for meaningful involvement or perhaps highlighting where meaningful involvement might not be as meaningful as it could be, that we can come back to this and remember that meaningful involvement is something that's not just in our community, but is something that is significant and actually defined by the U.S. Army when they are talking and training their uh, Army Corps of Engineers as well as people with the EPA. Our goals for the webinar, we're going to do a quick MEPA, Meaningful Involvement of People Living with HIV and AIDS, review. We're going to talk about what MEPA looked like in your organization's pre-positive organizing project and what it looks like now. We're going to share some current meaningful involvement models that have been drafted for us. Then we're going to talk about the Positive Organizing Project Meaningful Involvement Assessment. What was useful? Was it useful? Was it not at all useful? Um, as we then brainstorm meaningful involvement categories and how each of these can be measured in truly quantifiable, measurable means because as we impact change, we will then be able to go ahead and uh, impact our organizations as we're going. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Hartel to talk about the Denver Principles a bit. Carrie? Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so in the beginning, there were the Denver Principles. Um, you know, I think that there are a number of things. So the Denver Principles came up with the recommendations that frame a lot of our, our MEPA mindset. Um, so they were recommendations for people living with HIV um, to form caucuses and choose their own representatives or their own representation um, so that they could set their own agenda and plan their own strategies. Um, the thought is that uh, people living with HIV will be involved at every level of the decision-making process and specifically serve um, on boards and in seats of power um, for provider organizations and that people living with HIV would be um, included in um, all forums with equal credibility as other participants because we are the content experts. And um, I believe that the statement here on the Denver Principles um, is exceptionally powerful where we condemn attempts to label us as victims, a term which implies defeat, and we only occasionally identify as patients, a term which implies passivity, helplessness, helplessness and dependence upon the care of others. We are people living with AIDS and HIV. So, what's MEPA? MEPA is Meaningful Involvement of People with HIV in Programming, Policy, Funding, Decisions, and Actions that Impact Our Lives, right? It's centering people living with HIV in all of these processes. And we have to be intentional about um, ensuring that the people who are um, most impacted um, are centered in our discussions and our movements moving forward. So what does that mean? GIPA, woohoo! GIPA and MEPA, very close terms, right? Um, so GIPA is the greater involvement of people living with HIV and MEPA is the meaningful involvement, um, similar spin-offs, right? It's not a program or a project, but a principle of engagement. Um, so it's not about checking boxes, it's about really building um, meaningful and greater involvement into the process. Um, it realizes the rights and responsibilities of people living with HIV, um, including their right to self-determination and participation in decision-making processes that affect our lives. Um, it aims to enhance the quality and effectiveness of the HIV response, and it must include key populations um, and those who are often most disenfranchised in our movement. So um, men who have sex with men, um, transgender people, people who inject sex workers, youth, women, immigrants, people of color, um, so people who we often find are difficult to get to the table. Um, now my computer froze, so you all have to bear with me. <laughs> so, you know, our experiences have really shown us, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to move forward. Our experiences have really shown us that when communities are proactively involved in ensuring their own well-being, success is more likely. And as we develop MEPA leadership, 
um, we need to remember that it's not tokenism or gatekeeping, and it's more intensive than just peer leadership or linkage to care and services um, or education and awareness programs. It's really involving people living um, with HIV in the decision-making processes, not involving them after we've already made decisions or in low-level positions. I'm going to pass back to Barb, I think. I can't get my screen to work. Oh, there we go. Jeepa um, seeks to ensure that people living with HIV are equal partners and breaks down simplistic and false assumptions of service providers um, as those living with HIV and service receivers as those living, sorry, living without HIV and as service receivers as those living with HIV. Again, this is really just um, expanding upon the fact that we really are um, the experts when we talk about this and and we are the ones that need to be involved in the programmatic decisions because developing programs and then shaking your head and not understanding why people living with HIV don't show up at the table because it wasn't developed by us um, isn't effective as we utilize the ever shrinking resources um, for people living with HIV and curbing this epidemic. Back to Bob. Wonderful. Thanks, Carrie. I was just uh, making sure that I was off of mute. So this is a chance, as we have sort of mentioned in our emails, um, what we're hoping to do is to have this an opportunity to go ahead and um, have a conversation with our positive organizing partners. So what did it look like in your organization before you received the POP Year 3 grant? Um, why did you apply? What was a concern? Um, what was perhaps something that people didn't even know should they should be concerned about that since you have um, looked at it and feel like you uh, really have some work to do in your organization for MEPA? And, um, you know, this is a safe space. We've all, I hope, developed a certain amount of trust and partnership. So um, whatever you say here will not be at all reflected back on your organization, but really will be just a chance to talk about perhaps how we have uh, disenfranchised and disengaged with MEPA. Is anybody who would like to go, and if you want to go ahead and write it in the chat box, I can go ahead and read it, or it's star six to unmute your phones. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Star six to unmute your phone. Yep, star six, uh, Jason. Yeah. And I can. Jason, I just tried to go ahead and unmute you myself, but um, you're not connected, so. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Let me. All right. So, Jason, why don't you go ahead and type it in the text box, and I will go see. According to what I have, everybody should be able to unmute their phones. Um, good old stinky. Any meeting looks like it is. And unfortunately, there is no, let me just see here. Um, I apologize, we're unfortunately having some technical difficulties here. Um, 
Barb, I don't know if you saw mm-hmm. Tammy's message, but she said with the new platform, she's had to promote everybody to hear them, and then folks just have to use the good old-fashioned mute button on your phone so that the background noise is I didn't it. see that. Yeah, thanks for letting me know. I will go ahead and give that a try. And... Yeah. So, so Jason, okay. and we'll, oh, <laughs> go ahead, Barb. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, Brandon and Jason, I was not able to promote you presenters, um, but it looks like I was able to present almost everybody else. So we need everybody to mute your phones. And Barbara Jason Kirk, and Jim. Yeah. Star six? Or you can just go ahead and just mute your phone, just mute it with the mute button. And we've got a comment from Russell, which we'll go ahead and discuss while everybody doing that. And so Russell said, before POP3, engagement was basically the establishment of a community advisory board. And then Andy asked uh, Russell how it had changed. And Russell has said, now because of the Stigma Index Project, people living with HIV are leading the project. And so, Russell, if I understand correctly, yes, that they're determining action plans, absolutely. And we've got a bit of background noise. If you're not speaking, go ahead and star six mute or press mute on your phone. All right. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Are you able yes. to say something, Robert? Sir? We're getting feedback from you. So if you could mute your phone, please. Or your computer. All right, Robert, could you mute your phone, please, Robert? Sir? All right, Robert, I had to go ahead and mute you myself. Sorry. So we'll go ahead and, uh, okay, I think your computer is not muted then, Robert. Which Robert? Yeah, so if everybody can just take a minute, because we're getting a lot of feedback noise, and we'd love to hear from people. If you can go ahead and just mute your computer and mute your phone, that would be great. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, continue on. Um, but Russell, thank you for your comments about um, the engagement of people living with HIV how they're leading the project, determining their action plans, implementing the plans, and that his role is now supported. And so it sounds in many ways that, um, you know, the Stigma Index Project in Louisiana has figured out how to be really, truly um, NEPA-centered by having people living with HIV not just um, part of the interviews for the Stigma Index, but also to be able to come up with action plans for how to address some of the um, challenging areas that the stigma index has identified. And so thank you for those, those comments, Russell. I appreciate that. Anyone else want to either type or um, unmute and share some of what MEPA looked like in your organization before the POP grant? or what changes you've seen, whether they're intentional or unintentional.
giving people a few more minutes to unmute or to share thoughts they might have. So we've also heard from Meta Smith Davis, who's also with the Stigma Index Project in Louisiana. And she said, as coordinator for the Baton Rouge area, having folks that are playing key roles in planning what our next steps are going to be great for all of us. And I apologize, Jason. There's some frustration about the technology challenges, and um, that does make it difficult to share complex challenges um, in complex situations. So. I appreciate everyone's tolerance, and it is not an easy situation, and I apologize. All right, so we'll go ahead and just continue forward since it um, looks like technology is not our friend today. So what we have included next are some um, period of involvement for people living with HIV, and these are um, from the UNA's Best Practices Guide. And it is originally from the Principle to Practice in 1999. As then you can see, this pyramid is something that is frequently used where we have target audiences at the bottom, which is that people living with HIV are really just um, audience of the communication is one directional, that they're seen as patients, and that they are um, being in, informed and educated but have very little impact on the process. So the start of the pyramid where there are decision makers where people living with HIV are in key decision making roles. As you can see, this particular target um, and pyramid talks about people living with HIV and how they can move through the process and how with experience and training as well as engagement, they can be more engaged and more meaningfully involved. Um, I find this very interesting because both of the pyramids of involvement or the models of involvement by people living with HIV are about how people living with HIV can be engaged and do not study the impact on the organization other than sort of in an ancillary way. And so I think that, that is um, something that we have all struggled with about what and how we can message and support um, the HIV engagement as a true and powerful way for our communities as well as our organizations to grow and to change. Um, so next we have the mechanisms. And by the way, we will go ahead and share the slides with everybody um, after the webinar so that you can go ahead and have access to these models if you're interested in studying them a bit more. Um, then we next have the model about the UNA's policy brief from the GPA 2007. This is the one that Carrie had referenced earlier, where it talks about um, really moving beyond the service provider and the service uh, receiver, with people living with HIV only being the service receiver, and uh, people who are HIV negative being the service providers. And this uh, is really talking about how we can involve people living with HIV and um, many different aspects uh, organizationally. And I like this a little bit better because it doesn't seem like you just start in one place and move up the ladder of engagement, but also talks about how you can shift as you are moving up the, you know, as you are uh, becoming more engaged as well as more empowered. Um, and they range broadly from the personal. Oh, we are hearing some background noise. If somebody can go ahead and mute your phone, please. Yeah, I think I think I was good. I was taking a mute. All right. Um, so what we've done is we have looked at this, and then we it goes from the meaningful involvement of people from the personal to the community level. Talks about being involved in. Um, advocacy as well as campaigns, 
network and support program development, policy making, and treatment rollout and preparedness. And I think that this is all places where we've seen MEPA and have wanted to expand MEPA in our own organizations. But again, it is about um, people and how people can be engaged. And what we really are looking at is how do we turn that around and reflect and measure back on the organizations themselves. So many of you who started off um, with us at the beginning of the Positive Organizing Project were familiar with the MEPA assessment that we sent. And um, it was a 31 question uh, sort of assessment and it was filled out by the lead in the organization as well as the person living with HIV who is your key partner. And I thought it was very interesting just to go ahead and take one of the questions. Um, and so what we've done is particular question 12, is there any formal personal living with HIV advisory progress process in place in your organization, for example, a consumer advisory board or a PLHIV caucus? Um, and then people could answer yes with voting rights, yes in an advisory ca capacity, or no, and then there was an opportunity for them to um, add a little bit extra if they wanted to about it. And this is sort of a um, crystal clear example of why measuring NEPA is so challenging. If we go with the assumption that we want to impact NEPA shift through the Positive Organizing Project, um, it would be great if we could start off with a baseline measurement, through the process be able to see change and then to measure it at the end so we can have that quantifiable shift. Um, so just for this question alone, the responses that I pulled from a couple of the uh, questionnaires that people have filled out, and I have stripped out the identifying information that they ranged from, yes, yes, I mean no, what do you mean by formal? Uh, someone left it blank. Someone else said, we hear from our consumers all the time, they don't have a formal uh, way to tell us what's wrong with the organizations but my, they send emails and write notes all the time. Another person responded, we have a group, it's outlined in our bylaws that they don't meet much anymore. And then finally, we have a strong group, they meet and decide what they need the organization to provide so others can access services easily. They are our best ambassadors. So while this was helpful when we were looking at each organization and how we could partner with them to develop um, the meaningful involvement and the leadership of people living with HIV, it's not very quantifiable. So this is a great tool, but it is not a great way to measure MEPA in an organization. So we come back to this question about how do you track improvements? Um, how do you go and look at an organization and say that they actually are pretty good at implementing MEPA, um, but could work in one particular area a little bit more and could improve? versus an organization that might think that they're really great at MEPA, but are tokenizing people living with HIV, are um, really having a community advisory board that they don't pay attention to. A lot of these things that we've seen over the years, and again, we're not really trying to point fingers or embarrass people, but to say, if we take this grant as something that is really important that we really want to impact change with, how do we measure it and how do we show where we can improve? And so finally, I just wanted to say around meaningful involvement. Um, sometimes we get meaningful involvement with being open about your status confused. And I think it's very important. And uh, as I was doing some research for this webinar, I came across the best practices from principle to practice. Um, in 1999, they said that NEPA does not demand disclosure. And I think it is a good and an important thing for us to hold on to. We cannot allow people who are afraid of being open about their status to not be involved. Um, we need to figure out how they can be involved along the continuum of disclosure. So it could be that we have letter writing campaigns. It could be that they are involved in voter education, voter registration. It could be that they talk about their friend who's living with HIV when they're developing advocacy talking points. But we need to be very clever because if we say that being meaningfully involved in being a leader demands disclosure, then we are um, really eliminating a significant percentage of the population who is living with HIV, who for a variety of reasons 
whether it is safety, whether it is for fear of um, social repercussions. And I'm not talking about just dating repercussions. I'm talking about we all know people who have been excommunicated from their churches. Uh, we know people who have been shunned by their families. And we know certainly people who have been subjected to intimate partner violence when their status has been disclosed. Um, just recently, we heard of a woman who actually was deemed an unfit parent and lost custody of her children, strictly based on her HIV status. And so in 1999, this was an important premise. And in 2017, this continues to be something that we really must um, be clever and figure out how to work with. So with that, I'll draw my part of the presentation to a conclusion and uh, turn it over to Andy. And I will do a Thanks, sound check. Um, Andy. Great. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we certainly can. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So we are going to... Uh, uh, I have an echo on mine. Um, I may need to... Uh, do you all hear an echo? No. Yes. Okay. Um, I really hate this platform. And I can't wait till we kill this platform from our vocabulary. <laughs> um, so I appreciate everyone sticking through the technology challenges. Um, you know, uh, we're trying to do this a little differently. We were going to do kind of a didactic presentation on evaluation measures. And what we realized was that um, making this meaningful to the grantees, all of you have kind of gone through this process of trying to make MEPA uh, meaningful and matter in your organizations and your and your communities. And we realize that um, like developing most evaluation tools, uh, we start with the experts and we kind of focus group and figure out dimensions that we can measure. And that's really kind of what we want you all to think about are the kind of ways that you could conceptualize or measure MEPA in various parts of your organizations, your communities. And so for the next part, Robert and I, Robert Vasquez Pacheco and I are going to um, facilitate a discussion. But the first thing, and Barb's going to um, take notes, so there's going to be a couple of technology challenges here because um, we're going to try to have a discussion with this um, system and the way that it's um, kind of randomly muting and unmuting and echoing. Um, but anyways, uh, to start out, I want us to think about how do we think about MEPA in 2017. Um, you know, I think it's important to know the history and the activism that kind of centered MEPA. And so Carrie brought us through that when she talked about the Denver Principles. And, um, you know, the, the Denver Principles is a far-reaching document. It's, I think it's a page long, if that, and really impacted kind of the way we conceptualize HIV services, HIV organizations, and um, in a lot of ways impacted the way that um, patient care is delivered uh, or what does quality patient care mean and I think that's an amazing thing to know about our past and that we organized as people living with HIV and, and our allies to change this, this um, dialogue. But we also need to um, think about what does it mean today. So the history and activism is important, but times change. Um, right now, we're living in a very medicalized uh, world around HIV. And um, some of that is good. You know, treatment does work, and a lot of us benefit from um, the fact that treatment is available, that we have high-quality care, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it also means that our organizations have changed dramatically to kind of understand the medicalization of HIV. And I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we as people living with HIV, are we legible or visible in the healthcare setting right now, in the wider healthcare space, not just in HIV space? Um, and I'd argue that we're not yet visible in a lot of the um, healthcare space right now, but we could be. And I think uh, one of the learning models for us is to kind of think of ways that our activism can be parlayed into creating meaningful voices um, in the healthcare space. Um, so not just organizing in kind of grassroots organizing, but also looking at 
Um, sorry, I'm getting an echo on my phone. Um, I may have to uh, log. Uh, hmm. All right, so now the system is randomly muting people. Um, I am back. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. And yes, indeed, we are just um, going to keep struggling through because we are persistent advocates. And again, I apologize. Um, Andy, go ahead and try and star six to unmute. Because I just was magically muted myself in the midst of talking. So, yes, indeed. Can you hear me, Barb? I can. Robert, welcome. Okay. So, okay. I get. So, just. <laughs> uh, okay. Andy, hang on a second. I'm trying to find you in the midst of this really populated webinar, which is so disappointing that um, we unfortunately are not better able to um, deal with technology. Hello, Barb. I tried to rejoin it. No, uh -huh, you're here. Welcome, Andy. We've got yep. Andy and Robert. Okay. Yes. So I was saying, uh, let me go back to what I was saying. So I think one of the challenges that we have as people living with HIV is trying to make ourselves legible in the healthcare space. And I think there is a point to that. Um, the federally qualified health centers and community health centers are going to take on more and more of HIV care. And one of the, the requirements they have is 51% of their boards have to be um, people that are actually patients in the clinic. And I sit on a federally qualified health center board, and I'm shocked at, um, uh, you know, everything is about money in these settings. But it's also important as people living with HIV that we articulate what does quality of care look like for us? What does it mean to be welcome in a space? What does it mean to be stigmatized in a space? And I think that that voice is particularly important. And we need to kind of remind organizations why MEPA is still important. It's important because of the way that policy gets made, it's important because of the way that programs get created. It's important because of the quality of care. Um, and Robert and I are going to take us through, going to take you all through some brainstorming sessions that will try um, mightily to uh, uh, get down. Barb's going to take notes on a screen share as we go through these ideas for how MEPA can be measured. And um, I'm also going to propose that uh, after this is over, um, I can create a, a Google Doc so that. Um, people can uh, participate, can continue participating um, kind of uh, virtually in developing these measurement tools. Um, and hopefully our, our 
idea is that uh, by having you all participate and kind of sharing your knowledge and, and seeing kinds of ways that um, you've seen MEPA change in your organization, whether it's what Russell said um, or ways that you didn't see it change and you wish you had, um, to really think about uh, what what are what are things that would have been useful for you? What are what are outcomes that would be useful to measure? Um, what are process objectives that would be useful to measure? Um, and I and Robert. Uh, so right now we've got the screen share that Barb's putting up, and um, Robert and I. So we talked. The four of us talked, and we thought, you know, kind of the common places that we see um, MEPA. Uh, looked at is at the organizational level. And sometimes it's about kind of feelings of empowerment. And sometimes it's um, about kind of, mo you know, ways that people can participate. And what we wanted to do is look at it in terms of the larger buckets of leadership, program, policy, personal. And so um, uh, Robert and I are going to walk you through this. So the first thing we wanted to look at was leadership. Um, Robert, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Mr. Vasquez Pacheco. <laughs> can you hear okay. me? Okay. Oh, can now you I hear can. me. Oh, now I can. Okay. So um, organizations have different concepts of of leadership. So one of the things that we have to think about is what does what does a leader look like? And one of the things that we can say is that leaders actually have power to make decisions. And that becomes a very, very important aspect of the involvement of people living with AIDS in organizations, the fact that we have the ability to make decisions that will impact the organization and consequently impact ourselves. So one of the first things to look at is who in the organization, you know, functions as a leader and how many of those folks, whether it's the board, the staff, the community advisory board, or the folks who are in charge of budgeting, who have the power to make decisions about what is happening, what the policies are, what the programs are, et cetera, et cetera. Andy? So, yeah, so what do you all think uh, in terms of what, uh, what are ways that you can uh, look at board, staff, community advisory board um, in your organizations? I mean, some of the easy things to think about would be like the numbers, how many people are on the board or how many people are on staff. Um, is there a community advisory board? So those are kind of easy metrics to look at, right? Um, but what are other things to think about? Anyone? Do we have people this unmuted? Jason, can you hear me? People? Oh, Jason, yes. Hey. Hey, everybody. Um, one of the things that I was surprised to find out about Harnham United's board is that uh, the client representatives um, can be uninvited to board meetings, particularly board meetings that will affect um, program and services, such as closure, or when sensitive information about um, staff, such as layoffs or staff discipline processes, are being discussed. Um, and, you know, that makes me think back to what was discussed earlier in the webinar about um, if uh, MIPA is also about having equal participation in um, governing bodies or decision-making processes that uh, people are invited to be a part of. And that's certainly one of the areas where um, there's opportunity for growth at Heart and United. Thanks, Jason. That's uh Powerful example. Um, it's it's amazing. A lot of boards actually follow that model. I, there's a federally qualified health center that doesn't allow their board their patient um, representation on their board to attend the quality improvement committee because they think that it we have a conflict of interest um, because our our care is being discussed. So it's also interesting that we can look at kind of not just the dimension of our people at the table, but can they be just invited from the table? Right. That's great. Any 
anybody else? What about in terms of staffing? Um, one of the things that I struggle with um, with organizations all over the country, you know, we, we work with organizations all over the country, and many of them say things like, uh, we don't have anybody on staff who's openly HIV positive, and we think it's rude to ask. So how would people feel about that? Um, how do people feel about that kind of statement? Um, what are ways that we think are um, respectable ways of engaging or, or visibility, or what do we think would be meaningful in terms of staffing? This is Jason again. I, I think that um, this is a complex issue because of um, varying state HIV disclosure laws. Um, I know that at Harlem United, we specifically do not ask um, HIV status uh, on anything related to um, staff hire or, or staff meetings or um, offering opportunities to disclose because of um, concern over um, exposing the agency to risk, um, how to collect and keep that information in a secure way when it's related to staff, and in it just being an outright violation of the law. Right. Right. I guess, um, thanks, Jason. I wasn't really talking about mandatory disclosure. I was talking about... Um, you know, I think that there's uh, also spaces and organizations that tell us whether we're um, encouraged to disclose or not, or if it's a safe space. Do you know what I mean? I do, I, and, and I, I would love to be a part of, um, if I can, trying to figure that out. I, I think that um, at the end of the day, an agency has to ask itself if, if for example, we have a management team and there is a, a meeting or a document handed out where, um, you know, in a very carefully friendly worded way, people are encouraged to, that this is a safe space for them to disclose their HIV status because um, of, for all the reasons we've been discussing on this meeting. And um, a couple of staff members choose to disclose their HIV status and then for some reason there is a um, disciplinary process or layoff process and it affects one or more of the staff who have disclosed. It opens the agency to risk of a lawsuit that decisions are being made based on the HIV status of uh, a staff member. And I, I don't know how to get around that. I think it would require um, maybe this group to form a committee of employment um, attorneys or people with employment expertise and to provide organizations with a template that they could use that sort of meets the mutual goal that we're discussing here, but also of not putting anybody or any agency at risk. Cool. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I think, um, there's definitely the legal concerns that organizations have. I guess one of the things that I always push back on is kind of the culture of organizations and, um, you know, whether, you know, how is kind of diversity celebrated or how is, you know, uh, and I think that that's kind of where there is a, there, a need for an organization to protect itself, but I think in the case of MEPA, we're also talking about why or why not do people disclose, which might be a different way of looking at it. Um, I wanted to call attention, Meta, uh, hey, Meta. Um, brought up on the chat box to look at whether or not members of the board are living with HIV, but also... Um, also, are they uh, reflective of the folks that the organization serves, which is a great point. So it's not just about getting people living with HIV involved, but about getting people that are reflective of the local, um, the local Community. epidemic. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, what about in the Community Advisory Board? Do people have ideas about that, or if we're still on staffing?
Um, this is Jason. I, I think with consumer advisory boards, you you can avoid some of the um, concerns that I was just talking about because a lot of uh, boards that form are often required, and they're required for programs that only serve people living with HIV. And you know that was certainly the case for um, uh, Harm United's POP grant, which, while it supported our advocacy program broadly, the space where those meetings were held, the way in which we recruited our our stipend paid peer empowerment leaders were through programs that um, clients can only be a part of if they are HIV positive. But that doesn't help for programs that might not include people who are HIV positive. For example, while I was at Harm United, um, our housing program grew to include a new program that housed veterans, and it was the first housing program that we have, and still the only one, where being HIV positive isn't a requirement to get the housing. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where we, um, so yeah, there we are. So, that's a great point. Is it, uh, is it restricted to PLHIV or is it restricted or is it, can we expand it? And I think that that's something that every organization, you know, it's a great point. I think every organization is in a unique space because, you know, all of our communities look differently and um, we're dealing with different communities. And I think that, um, you know, that really is about kind of, you know, we're talking about um, restricting it to PLHIV or looking at those most impacted or people that have um, kind of multiple similar structural challenges. Um, Andy, can I jump in? Yeah, please. This is Carrie. <clears throat> so I think that community advisory boards are a tricky, tricky form of MIFA because I think funding sources, especially HRSA sources, have required them for so long that they often become not meaningful. Um, that it's often just about checking boxes and that the processes and decisions that are made or discussed in community advisory boards are often not brought up to policy and don't impact policy changes. Um, so I guess I would push people to think about it in that context um, because I think sometimes we get really comfortable thinking like, oh, there's a there's a cab here, that's great. But I I have found, at least in Colorado, that most of the CABs are actually have no impact on programming, may get involved after a program has been kind of determined to co-sign, so to speak, and oftentimes are bullied out when they don't just co-sign um, and do want greater involvement in processes. And I think a lot of us have that experience. Um, being part of community advisory boards or actually watching organizations run them. Um, so thanks for bringing that, up, bringing that up. So also looking at kind of ways that the community advisory board has leadership or how, if they even have voted no on anything. So Meta also brings up the idea that uh, to kind of uh, see representation and membership and cycling it. So looking at diversity and membership of the CAB, are there term limits? How do you recruit new ones? Right. In what community are you recruiting? So uh, Robert Sturm has said that uh, he's found that because of what we're talking about, uh, that often people living with HIV in New Mexico don't want to participate in CABs, um, and I don't blame them. <laughs> Sorry, it's, I don't. I, I have a very <laughs> similar reaction to that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think that that's part of it, Robert. Is that. Um, you know, even looking at people not participating, I think sometimes when we look at negative space, that can be productive also. So looking at kind of if the, 
you know, like an organization says, we, we, well, we have a community advisory board, but nobody comes, that's still a sign that there's a problem. Um, right. So, you know, when people say things like, well, I put on the program and nobody showed up, so it's the community that should have showed up, I always think, or you could have designed the program with the community <laughs> at heart. Like, we've all had disastrous programs where no one shows up. I always feel like the person that threw a party and no one showed up. Um, but it's because, you know, you didn't involve people. It wasn't, didn't sound fun or whatever it was. And sometimes we don't, organizations don't take a critical self-reflection to think of why people aren't coming. Right. Or you have, or you have a situation where people are actually, you don't get representation from the broader community. You just get a group of people. I think Meta mentioned it was the same group of, of folks that would show up all the time. And that becomes problematic because then, because it's not giving everyone the opportunity to be heard or to participate. So the organizations do have to make sure that they are broad enough, they're casting a broad enough net to be able to include all of the people that need to be included in that situation. Yeah, so I think, you know, when we think about ways of measuring, it could be kind of follow-up questions around if these things don't exist, why not, and have you asked people? Because um, I love what you're saying, Robert, about, you know, I went ahead and asked people why they're not doing that. Um, right. And then Carrie talking about uh, that people should be able to be able to walk away when they're not being heard, um, which is great. Barb, I actually can't read the next thing on your Word document. What is that? Budgeting. Oh, is that? Sorry. I'm reading from a tablet. Sorry, folks. Um, so budgeting. Budgeting. MEPA involvement in budgeting. Um, I think uh, that's tricky. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very tricky. Because in, as as we all know, in this situation, you know, organizations are very, very, very careful about who gets access to making budget budgeting decisions. Oh, I see. I see here, Barb is putting notes here. Are there funds that decide to support PLHV engagement? That's true. Um, if you want people to show up, then um, you know, resources have to be set aside for that, whatever those resources look like. Um, right. You know, in some places, like at Harlem United or in other places, you know, because it's a New York City transit system, it's relatively easy to get people to meetings. Um, you know, MetroCard, whatever. Uh, but in other places, you know, that can be a challenge. And I, Barb and I met with a group in L.A. Um, last year, the year before, and they they didn't want to meet, um, they didn't want to involve more community members because they actually said, we might have to meet on the weekend. And Barb and I were like, yeah, <laughs> huh? <laughs> What's right. your point? Um, and so there's that whole idea of what kinds of resources are being made available. You know, is there weekend space available? Is there evening meetings available? Um, is there child care available? Yeah. And that, those are all resource-sensitive issues, and I think um, those are things we can build in. Um, do people have other ideas for resource resourcing community engagement? I think it's also, um, um, as we're seeing here, technology can be uh, one way to involve the community. If, of course, people have access to the technology, but it may be a, an effective way to do that where people can feel comfortable in participating. Even like staffing, um, like having somebody whose who's specific uh, role is to you know, coordinate and make sure that people are invited. Um, people are invited to the meetings and people get, um, you know, get the right access, that people's emails are correct or phone numbers are correct. Um, that can be important too. Um, we can move on if people ha don't have anything to add on the resourcing element. Um, to programming, which I think is something that uh, people are uh, definitely more, uh, I think many of us are more familiar with kind of the programming needs. 
Um, so here we thought of assessment of needs, implementation, and evaluation. Um, you know, programming is often kind of, uh, you know, or programming should be designed by first assessing the needs of the community, you know, um, then a program is designed and implemented, and then, um, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, you know, these programs are evaluated, and then the, the, the data from the evaluation is fed back to improve the program. That's the ideal model that, you know, that most of us learn um, by doing this work. But in practice, how are PLHIV involved? How can we, um, how can we involve PLHIV? What are ways of measuring if PLHIV are involved in programming? People have ideas? Um, this is Jason for um, our grant, which was a significant part of creating a brand new client-based advocacy program. Um, there were a few things that happened that were, I think, really key to making um, um, individuals living with HIV a core part, some of which we thought of in advance and some of which um, we got from from their suggestion or it, it sort of happened by circumstance in a positive way. Um, from a, a programmatic standpoint, um, the inclusion of our stipended peer leaders and the creation of the um, curriculum for the program and the training curriculum for other client advocates was key. Um, that was planned and proved to be helpful in, in ways we definitely had hoped. Um, one area where that sort of happened more by circumstance that was really helpful was um, the fact that uh, after about a month, I think, into the weekly meetings that our um, peer leaders are having with their peers, um, we decided not to have any staff members sit in on those meetings. Uh, and that was a big change for me relative to the other client advocacy programs I had been a part of running. It was just presumed that a staff member needed to be there to help deal with um, issues like a peer being confronted with a fellow peer um, behaving or acting in a way that was disrupting the group and not feeling comfortable or having the authority like a staff member to deal with the situation, de-escalate it, and or ask the peer to leave. Um, or even just bias, however unintended, on the part of staff, thinking that as the, you know, school trained, hired staff, they needed to be there to ensure that the peers were, you know, quote, doing it right. Um, and what we found instead was that the absence of a staff member further empowered the peers and the clients to really focus inwardly with each other and engage with each other instead of looking outwardly at the staff member who often, you know, we're dealing primarily with clients who live below federal poverty level and are people of color, who would then look to the white person who walked into the room in a suit and tie as the person they had to get permission from to talk about or move on to different subjects or to talk about things in certain ways. Those are two um, examples of kind of opposite extremes of how we um, both intended and then in unintended ways um, facilitated MEPA in the program. Wow, that's great. Um, and I, I actually was laughing. I was on mute. I was laughing at the whole image of everyone waiting for the white guy in the suit to say something. <laughs> and I appreciate that because um, I do feel like oftentimes people are waiting or they, they have like, um, you know, the, 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 the reaction that we're trained to do as people living with HIV in these organizations is to wait for the staff person to talk to the staff person. Um, and so I love the idea that um, you remove that uh, and allow the conversation that just happened. Right. And, and, and in allowing... Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, it allows for a certain degree of self-empowerment that people don't generally get. And if we're talking about people who live at the poverty level, I mean, the poor don't make decisions for themselves. Everyone makes decisions for the poor. And so it's important to allow people, to give people 
the opportunity to make their own decisions so that they can actually um, become not only invested in the program, but they can also feel as if the program is actually doing something for them. Terry brings up some interesting points about um, having people living with HIV help frame the assessment questions, um, particularly push it because uh, sometimes those can be outside of the norm or usual questions that are asked in um, assessments, um, as well as to strategize um, for solutions based on the feedback. Um, so those are concrete ways that people living with HIV can be involved um, in the assessment. Um, you know, one of the things I've seen in a lot of organizations, and I have worked at organizations that have done this, is they say, oh, well, we, you know, we asked the community advisory group if they, um, you know, if this program was going to work, and, that's, and they said yes, and then when you ask the people in the cab, their recollection of that event is not quite the same, <laughs> um, because, you know, they were, they were brought together to just have pizza or something, um, and I think that we've seen that in assessment, and then often in the implementation process, um, the project doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the local community for whatever reason. Um, uh, but how can um, people living with HIV in be involved in the implementation or evaluation of a program? Um, this is Jason. There are two ways that we achieve that in our client advocacy program. Um, the first is that uh, a key metric um, written into the grant was a pre and post test of an HIV stigma index. So obviously that is information that we're getting directly from participants. Uh, also, we wrote in a um, client satisfaction survey um, and we adapted the survey used from the program from an overall agency satisfaction survey. Um, we reduced the number of questions and took out things that weren't specific or relevant to the program. And our, our stipend peer empowerment leaders were a part of taking a look at that satisfaction survey and providing feedback before it was finalized and um, distributed to the clients to complete. And Jason, once the client completed it, what happened? So um, that's happening right now. Um, you know, the grant period is right. coming to a close. And the uh, end of this week is the goal of completing both the um, post-HIV stigma index surveys and the satisfaction surveys. Um, our uh, evaluation analytics department will then be compiling and spitting out some um, charts and tables for Brandon and I to look at to generate a report. And I think it's important for those data to be made available to both the stipend peers and participants. And we are having a um, sort of closing grant party um, on June 23rd. And I'm, I'm planning on us having some form of more formal um, presentation at that party that will include the outcomes from both of those measurement tools. Great, thank you. So I think um, I think it's important. One of the things that um, Jason brings up around evaluation is to kind of have this feedback loop set in an organization. And I know that not all organizations have that capacity, but it's 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 part of kind of building um, a cycle or a process that MEPA can be part of. So remember, MEPA is not a program; it's it's a process and it's dynamic. And so the more that people can push towards having moments of reflection, looking at data, um, sharing that data with the people who participated in it, which I think is really important, um, I do think that that's, that's something to think about in terms of evaluation processes. Anybody else have any other ideas for how people living with HIV can, can be involved in implementation or evaluation?
Cool. Well, we're we want to start this process, um, uh, but we also want to be able to um, leave it open um, so that we can start building um, different tools. Hello. Um, can I say something? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name is Teresia. My, my name is Teresia from ICW North America, and I just wanted to mention about one of the things that we are doing for involving um, communities in, 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 in implementation. One of the things we did is we are also conscious of the fact that most of the organizations and agency also mobilize people living with HIV, also as service recipients. And, you know, we end up in this cycle of especially calling on women to participate in our meetings, in our webinars. But what we thought was an opportunity for having the women using their expertise because they have skills in their own way, they have experience of living with HIV and they can do work in their own communities. And so uh, our project sort of uh, gave them that opportunity and leeway to organize uh, community forums with other women living with HIV in their locality. And so they would report back to us on what was happening, some of the conversations they had, some of the advocacy initiative they want to take on, and, and any other feedback that they got. So it's like they are taking the lead. So women we take lead in their own community because they know it better and they have partners they can they can participate uh, with or involve in this kind of work. Sorry, did you hear me? Yes, we did. That's great. Um, I think it's important to build the feedback loops in so that people are able to, um, you know, that have, so they can access ways to give you feedback and make it meaningful. Right. Thank you. Also in designing the, also in designing the evaluation, I think it's important to realize uh, to take some time to design the evaluation so that you get the information that you want out of it. Many times people have evaluations that they design sometimes even after the program is running. And so if it's not, if, if you haven't built in what the data is that you want, you're not going to get it. Um, thank you. That's a really important point. And it's also interesting, though, in, in uh, I think what this program is attempting to do for all grantees is often um, create something new or develop new standards. Sometimes you're not going to know what it is that you need or need to measure until after you've started. Um, so, for example, uh, we did a, a, you know, this quick back of the envelope assessment of our HIV stigma pretest, and we found um, pretty low low score on the HIV stigma specific measurements across all participants who primarily come from an adult day healthcare program, which is only for people living with HIV, really have access to interventions like um, mental health counseling and, and peer support um, where they're in an environment where they're only with other people living with HIV. So that could be affecting the way that they perceive their own stigma but we saw higher scores on measures of things related to how they are treated based on their um, socioeconomic class and their race and their gender. Right. Um, and so if there were a, a version two of this program that were to happen, it would be, you know, I, I would sort of reinvest in um, broadening how we're measuring other aspects of stigma that overlap with each other and what program interventions that we're doing to um, address them. A very good point, Jason, because as we all know, AIDS and HIV is a nexus of, of a variety of societal issues that deal with not only identity, but with class, you know, with location, with education. And so sometimes it's hard to sort of tease out the different strands of what is happening in those situations.
exactly and and that is that is a situation that might be specific to where a program like ours or others are being um implemented so in a place like Harlem in New York which is ghettoized in a place where the the portion of the HIV positive community that we're supporting is already um, funneled into a, a small group that primarily fits into the qualification for the current adult day healthcare patient profile. Um, all of that makes what we're doing perhaps not applicable to a similar program in rural Kentucky, for example. Or, for example, in Spanish. So this is a great discussion. I want to be mindful of time. Um, we're at the 10-minute mark, um, and we've just kind of started on it. So I wanted to kind of point out that we just really wanted to touch on kind of the policy and the personal or individual. Um, and policy, you know, can be both organizational policy as well as where um, organizations choose to have advocacy or choose to um, be present um, or choose to make a stand. And I think uh, we're not going to be able to talk about all of these today, but um, I wanted to point them out so that we can have a more robust discussion virtually um, to build that out. I think one of the advantages of this kind of funding is that we're able to not just think in terms of service, but in terms of larger scale advocacy policy issues um, looking at structural elements of your communities um, and really challenging kind of those elements. There's a flexibility in the funding here. And I think um, we've seen a lot of the programs grow in terms of how you conceptualize these ideas. So it's not just how many people came to your meeting or did they feel good about it, but also, you know, what kinds of change were they able to make? How many choices did they have? And when we think about policy, um, Again, we're not going to be able to get into it here, but to really think about how organizations choose to make stands or, or how PLHIV are involved in assessing what a policy is effective. So, for instance, um, we see very clearly that many HIV organizations don't have a statement about criminalization, which affects PLHIV directly. And I, I, that kind of a simple statement about that, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's kind of obvious that we're not involved all the time in kind of the policy making and organizations. And I think that's something we, we should look at. Um, so again, we think we thought of policy as, as the assessment of the need, as well as the development of the policy and the community engagement of that policy. Um, so, you know, did they advance at the city council level? Did PLHIV get involved in that process? Um, and really looking at that. And this is stuff that we will um, continue in an, an, an online discussion. And then the personal individual MEPA things, I think, are actually the easier things to measure. Uh, but to think about ways that people um, have empowerment opportunities um, and that how they increase their advocacy in healthcare settings. But I wanted to um, kind of go over those briefly so that we can transition to the conclusion because we do only have a few minutes left. Um, Barb, did you want the mic back? Oh, I forgot we're on the screen share. So uh, I appreciate everyone being involved. I, I really enjoyed everyone's uh, participation. Um, and uh, we're going to now transition back to the webinar slides. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Andy. I appreciate your taking us through that discussion point and appreciate everybody on the webinar. I realize that for technology challenges, um, people might not have been able to participate. Um, but So we will go ahead and share this as well as share a Google Doc that will um, give you an opportunity to sort of put in some thoughts in this format that we've been going through uh, today because our hope is that by brainstorming with people who have been really on the ground working with positive organizing that we can create a um, assessment that is simple. Andy keeps saying we can do it in 10 questions, but um, probably will be maybe a little bit more than that, or there might be a two-part uh, question, a simple one and a more engaged one so that we can 
when we're looking at meaningful involvement, not just say, I'll know it when I see it, but actually have some measures so that we can also track and, and congratulate organizations that commit to uh, meaningfully involving people living with HIV. And, and Jason, I think your point is very important as well, is that we need to make sure that we're uh, engaging with people who are vulnerable to HIV so that it will be, um, you know, a prevention focused as well. Um, and maybe that's in the same room or maybe that's in a different room, but that we are really meaningfully engaging. So we will go ahead and share the slides and the notes and we'll have that in a Google Doc and people can go ahead and feel free to add any thoughts that they might have. Um, just want to say that appreciate working with everybody. It's been, as always, a engaging and exciting opportunity. We had 17 projects across the United States this year. This is our third year of our positive organizing project and want to thank our partners at AIDS United for this, this opportunity. I know that Julio is on the phone and I just would like to extend our thanks to Julio who has done a lot of work with the organizing and um, has been <laughs> very flexible in helping people with their scope of work, their work plans, and their budgets. Um, POP year four is in the works. We're not certain if it has been funded, but I do know that um, certainly people are interested in seeing the work that we have accomplished. So thank you to everyone. It has been an incredible opportunity to work with you, and I appreciate all of the wisdom that people have shared. Here are our contact information. If you would like to reach any of us, please feel free to do so. And then finally, because we um, have been really putting together a masterclass with you through the year on MEPA, here are the resources that we cite most often, and it includes the most uh, recent edition, which is the CERO Projects Network Empowerment Project, which was released yesterday. So um, this is a constantly evolving field, and I think that you know, just to wrap it up, we really can um, say that when we have people meaningfully involved who are impacted by HIV, who are living with HIV in partnership with our organizations, that, that is where the power has always come from. And as we continue to really work to decrease the impact of HIV in the United States as well as globally, that we need all of us on a board in uh, every capacity possible. So with that, I will see if any of my other co-presenters have anything to say in conclusion. Uh, oh, Andy. Andy. Um, Andy. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, I can set up. A, uh, I I'll set up a call for people that are interested in continuing the discussion and kind of doing a drill down as well as set up the Google Docs for people to be able to participate. Um, and you know, I appreciate everyone for their time and their patience. Um, and congratulations on a successful pop cycle. And Robert or Kerry? This is, well, this, I was just going to say yes, what Andy said. All right. Ditto from Robert and Kerry. Anything you would like to add? Nope. Thanks to everybody for their amazing work and participating in the webinar. So keep your eyes on your email. We will continue to share our um, MEPA measurement tool as we develop it and I would like to thank everybody for all of your patience as we tried to figure out the technology. Um, I'm pretty certain that this will be the last time that we will be using any meeting um, because it has certainly caused us quite a bit of challenges. So thank you everybody and have a great day and congratulations on your success of your positive organizing projects. It's been a, um, a powerful, powerful group of people to work with and it's been a lot of fun. So thank you so much.